Happy Easter. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome to SLCA. I would love to introduce our amazing soloists of the day. We have Wanda, Nero, Butler, and we have our sister, Lelena Romero, and the SLCA Singers. Yes, happy Easter. Esther, Oster, any one of them. <laughs> All right, we're gonna go old school and we're gonna pull a song up from the past. If you're feeling jiggy, sing with us. <laughs> Good 
Wow, wow, wow. wow Good wow. afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Spiritual Living Center of Atlanta, welcome to Easter Sunday, Easter afternoon. We're glad that you're here. Give it up for our choir again. Wanda Nero Butler. Yeah. Penelope Haniel. Wonderful, wonderful. Welcome again to Spiritual Living Center of Atlanta. Uh, my name is David Alexander. My pronouns are he and his. It's Transgender Day of Visibility, and we're so excited to honor that here today on Easter. You know, we're going to talk about some transcendence and transformation today. 
so we're so glad to welcome everybody watching on Facebook and online uh, this afternoon. Thank you for being in the room. Uh, I know it is uh, late in the Easter hour. Some people have been doing church all morning long, uh, including uh, my friend Reverend Adrian. I want to have him come up here and introduce himself in just a moment. Uh, but we want to thank you again for being here today. Uh, we're part of a global community called Centers for Spiritual Living, and we're part of an inclusive uh, movement of transcendent and consciousness that welcomes all. Whoever you are, wherever you are, you belong here. Give yourselves a hand for being here today. My friend, Reverend Adrian Moore uh, from Baltimore. Tell the people about you, what you're doing, what you're up to. You didn't know we were going to make you work as soon as you walked in the door. <laughs> he just made it so easy, just jumped right up there. Well, peace and blessings to everyone. It's just great to see another aspect of me today. Wow, look at me. Look at me. Woo! Uh, I, I just honor my friend, my brother, Reverend Dr. David Alexander. Doesn't he look sharp today? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. It's just great to be here. Uh, it's just great to feel what I'm feeling in this moment. I know that I'm in the right place at the right time. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, my wife and I, Kevia, live there, and we uh, oversee a ministry called Total Impact Church Center for Conscious Living. And so it's just uh, a pleasure to be here. I've been here this weekend uh, for spring break. I work in education. My oldest daughter uh, lives here. So spending some time with her and my two grands and and I wanted to have lunch with this guy, so we were able to make that happen and learn some stuff. Just learn some stuff from the Reverend Doctor. <laughs> and uh, so I'm appreciative of the time that we had to share together. And um, so since the service I was in with Bishop D.E., he, of course, ended early. I said, I got to get on over here. Oh, bless you. You know, bless I, you know I got to take advantage of the time that I'm here, so I'm glad that I did. Thank you so we much. We are so glad you're here. You belong. Welcome, my brother. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good to have you. And sit, enjoy, relax. Uh, so, welcome again to everyone here. Let's bring up uh, Mally LaPete for announcements. Announcements, announcements, announcements. Everything that's fit to print. Oh, she's going to just hop right on up. The music is that good. We're just hopping up out of our seat. Uh, <laughs> welcome. Okay, somebody lost some jewelry. There you go. Oh, there's no podium. Hello, everyone, all my little bunny rabbits. <laughs> I'm Mally LaPete, and I gladly serve here on the creative arts team at SLCA. We have so much opportunity for growth by connecting, growing, serving, and giving right here at SLCA. So for more information about today's announcements, and other opportunities, take a moment to scan the QR code found on the monitor beside me. Yeah, it's up there. Are you ready to increase your abundance and prosperity? Yeah. Big yeah. Join our SLCA ministers and practitioners in the month of April for a daily spiritual practice of spiritual mind treatment as we become aware of the flow of good that is surrounding us every day. We invite you to sign up today using the QR code as we prepare to be in joyous expectancy of our ever-flowing good and open to the abundant nature of the universe. I feel more open just reading that, right? Save the date for our annual town hall meeting. We will have our important town hall meeting after services during our social hour, April 14th. Please plan to attend. Please join us next Sunday, that's the first Sunday of the month, for our monthly potluck. Bring your favorite dish to share with our SLCA family who are always appreciative. We look forward to sharing great food and wonderful fellowship. Today is Transgender Day of Visibility. Wherever you are on your journey, we want you to know we see you, we hear you, we love you, and we stand with you. And above all, you belong. Thank you for joining us today. They're short today. We look forward to seeing you in the community hall 
for food and fellowship after the service. You belong. Once again, please welcome Wanda Nero Butler. So y'all know I'm getting too old for these shoes. <laughs> but them are some shoes. You always do shoes so well. I'm trying, they boots. I can't kick them off right now. <laughs> That's just too much. That's too much. <laughs> some of you may know this song. We tweak the lyrics just a little bit for us. But you can join in.
unfold your heart. Relax your senses. to fear looks like love's growing here so take your guard and let it down go deeper still until you come unwound this power and this presence, it's love, it's peace. I speak these words in the first person, and I invite you to accept whatever resonates with you. For I truly know that there's a greater expression of all of Spirit's divine attributes booing up here in the spiritual living center of Atlanta. All of its love, its peace, its ever givingness. I know that Reverend Dr. David Alexander's words fall on fertile ears. I know that his message today is an inspiration, a motivation filled with love, a healing balm. And so we center ourselves in that knowingness that this place is a place of belonging, a place of true love. And for that, I am so grateful. I'm grateful to this power and presence that hears me and hears me always. And with that, I can release it into this law that always does its right and perfect work. And please, I invite you to join me in sealing this treatment by saying, and so it is. You can't stop waiting for love to find you. Look inside your heart, love's already who you are. So lift up your voice Let it be heard Tell me your story Tell it to me Don't leave out a word I think I have been there too I'm a seeker just like you. You ain't got a thing to fear. Looks like love is growing here. So take your guard and let it down. Go deeper still until you come unwound. Yeah. Unbound. Welcome, Lelena Romero. Yeah. It's a gift to share this today because this is the first song that I wrote that I felt like came 
from me, truly. And so that I hope that you connect with it and sing any part of it you want, especially the part where it says I'm alive, because we are all here today alive. Outside into the bright day sun The troubles of my illusions on my mind I keep moving on, feel the cool breeze on my cheeks With every step I take on this path I know that I'm alive On this beautiful day I'm alive And as long as I keep moving I know that this moment is all that I have I'm alive as I walk in the bright day sun The branches are bare against the bright blue sky My heart is so heavy I don't know how it will heal I feel my breath expand as I keep moving I am peace and Just as I know seasons change I know right now that I'm alive On this Beautiful day, I'm alive And as long as I keep moving I know that this moment is all that I have I'm alive as I walk in the bright day sun Can you do this for me? Give me a little beat Only in movement I find stillness Only in movement I find peace Only in movement do I know that I am free my feet move so quickly, and yeah. my feet move so quickly. My feet move so quickly, and yeah. my feet move. Only in movement I find stillness. Only in movement I find peace. Only in movement do I know my divinity. My feet move so quickly, and yeah. my feet move. My feet move so quickly, and yeah. my feet move. Only in movement I find stillness. Only in movement I find peace. Only in movement do I know that I am free. I step outside into the bright day sun. I feel a little lighter, let it go, and I am free. Keep moving on, feel the cool breeze on my cheeks. Whatever step I take on this path, I know. This moment is all that I have This moment is all that we have This moment is all that I have I'm alive as I walk in the bright day sun Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let's give some more love to all of our music today. Yeah, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Feeling good? All right. It's a good day to be together. Again, I'm David Alexander, senior director, spiritual director here. My pronouns are he and his. I welcome you into this beautiful Easter afternoon. Are you having a good day? Yeah, let's keep it going today as we take a deep breath. Uh, we've been doing all month long this series, Seize the Day, uh, and we're going to wrap it up today with Easter and, um, and weave in all the different uh, elements of spring and all that stuff. So the tools for today, we've changed it up a little bit. I usually use the same ones throughout the series, but today is Easter, so we changed it up a little bit. Spiritual principle today is the principle of resurrection. 
looking at that thing which is eternal within us that is ever seeking to rise out of the ashes and, and um, out of from one season to the next and rise up within us. The spiritual law is the law of liberation, understanding that we are always on a trajectory to, 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 to ever be liberated from, as Ernest Holmes said, discord of every nature, and that goal is sure to be attained by all. Right, that there's a spirit of liberation that moves through the planet, moves through the creation, moves through the flowers and the earth and all around us. And we want to lean into the vibration of that law. And our spiritual practice today is connection. We can't do any of this alone. You can't do resurrection and liberation by yourself. Right? The blooms that are coming out of the branches on the tree that look dead to you. They didn't do that by themselves. They're connected to something deep. And it's that connection that gives that resurrecting power. It's that connection that connects them to that liberating law. So we tie all of that together. And to remind ourselves, as we, uh, as we have throughout this series, I've been saying that pattern recognition is the key to your mental liberation. Pattern recognition is the key to your mental liberation. So we're going to look today at a pattern. And really, Easter is, is, is simply the recognition of a pattern, right? The, the, the church, the Catholic church in particular, in the establishment of, of the Christian faith, in the establishment of uh, the liturgy that the Christian calendar uh, flows through, is really the very smart and strategic recognition of patterns, Right? Oh, y'all are doing this thing during the spring. Y'all are welcoming back the energy. Oh, okay, we got, we got something that matches that, right? Christmas time. Oh, you're welcoming the light, and you're in the darkest time of the year. You're gathering together and doing the. Oh, we got something that matches that, right? The recognition of a pattern that's always, has, has always been there and will always be there, but just new stories and new layers that go on that. So when we recognize patterns in our lives, when we see how our thinking is working for us and how it's working against us, when we can recognize patterns, we find ourselves easier on that path of liberation. And ultimately, Easter is the celebration, uh, just so we're reminded today, so nobody is confused, because I know today, this morning, it was like, you know, or this, this afternoon, uh, right? that's, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of church, right? When you go to a New Thought Center, spiritual center, right, sometimes it can be very churchy. Sometimes the music can be very, especially this, this time of year, right, it can be very sort of Jesus-oriented or uh, Christian-oriented, and you might think, oh, that, that, that was a lot. That, for me today, that was a lot. And for other people, it was like, no, that we're just getting started. I want some more of that, please. You know that, and you got everything in between, right? So I want to be very clear as we are uh, uh, engaging in this today, in in its fullness, that Easter is a celebration of an internal and eternal power, not an external one. It's a celebration of an internal and eternal power. It resides in you, and it is eternal. It's not outside of you. It's not over there. It's not, it's not something happening that happened 2,000 years ago or, or, or happened over there by some mysterious power that we can't understand. No, it's right there inside of you. And, it, 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 and regardless of whether Christianity existed or not, right, whether uh, Buddhism existed or not, whether Judaism existed or not, whether Hinduism existed or not, it is. It is an eternal power that ever exists in the universe, and we're simply recognizing and seeing the patterns and celebrating that today. Everybody with me? So despite how it, is, it maybe has looked in your past uh, experience or current expressions in many Christian churches, it's really all about the same thing. Paul Tillich, the great theologian, kind of summarized it easily for us. He said, Revelation, and I've he said man, I'm say, saying humanity uh, to gender uh, be inclusive here. Um, he said, Revelation is God's attempt to reach humanity. Religion is, huma- is the human attempt, or he said man's attempt, humanity's attempt, a human attempt to reach God. Right? Revelation is the eternal spirit ever seeking to break through. Revelation is, is the, the, the bud bursting forth with the new bloom. Right? It's the eternal thing, that internal and eternal thing breaking through. And the new growth and the new bud and the new expression is the revelation. 
Religion is when we take that and we say, okay, so an individual has a revelation. Jesus had a revelation. Moses had a revelation. Muhammad had a revelation. Buddha had a revelation. Hmm? Had a revelation one day. Right. Exactly. Don't get me started. I'll have to bring up Adrian to bail me out. <laughs> uh, right? So... Individuals have revelations, but then we gather around them and we t hear their story and we want them to tell their story and repeat their story. And then we start, people start taking notes and like, well, where were you standing when it happened? And what were you wearing when it happened? And what, what, what were you eating around the time that you, right? And where was the sun? And where was the this? And where was the that? And then we build rituals and traditions to commemorate that. Well, on this day, such and such was doing such and such, and, and, and the revelation came forward. So we're going to do all of the such and suches. That's religion. And so it looks a lot of different ways and has looked a lot of different ways and will continue to look a lot of different ways because religion is doing what religion does. But just for a moment, I want to invite us to think about the Easter story as someone thought it as if someone thought it to be true rather than uh, something that we think to be true instead just consider it as the parable that it is this parable you know my brother reverend adrian loves movies right he loved to go to the movies this parable this story the protagonist spends his life confronting those powers and principalities that abuse power, that abuse uh, uh, people, that abuse the least of these, and he confronts that power. And that power to, to be decides to squash him, to root him out, and to kill him, to bury him, to erase him from the history books. And they believe when they do this that once and for all they are done with him and they can go back to their power thing. It's a script we see in a lot of stories and a lot of movies. You can go to the movies this afternoon and watch something that will have that line in it, essentially. But of course, when they do this, they are not done. The story doesn't end there. And that is why we're here today. But long before there was this thing that we call Easter, there was what I, how I like to refer to it, an Easter moment, an Easter moment in consciousness. And what was that moment? To, to understand that, and we know in New Thought that everything begins in consciousness, and so the Easter, what is that Easter moment that begins this? The story tells us that it's a couple of days after he's buried. But we know now, we know enough, you know, you ever go to a movie, I, I, I love this, I have this with, with my, my children a lot, and particularly over the last several years with, with my oldest, uh, with Josh, you know, he's 19 now, but when he would be listening to music or, or watching a movie or something and be excited about that particular, and I won't name any particulars, I don't want to embarrass him, but, but something that, that he believes is brand new. Right? And name a music group and be like, oh, have you heard da da da? And I'm like, child, please. <laughs> you, know, you don't know nothing about that, right? <laughs> right? And so we know now that, that, that there's so many elements of the story that existed long before, right? They're written in this particular place, in, in the particular places in the Gospels, they're borrowed from Esther and Osiris and Mithras and various legends and traditions and stories. And so we go back and we unpack all of this and we say, well, when did that moment actually happen to such a degree that, that it became important to say, well, the best way to tell about this moment is to use this other story and this pattern of stories that says... The significance of the moment is the resurrection the three days after, right? Which is not unique to Jesus at all. Spoiler alert. <laughs> right? So, so if we unpack that context a little bit, what's the context that leads up to the consciousness moment as a new thought thinker, as a metaphysician, as a new thought theologian? That's what I want to know as a, as a 
person in spiritual practice with, with the laws of consciousness, I want to know what is that moment and what led up to that moment in consciousness? And so some of the things we can look at, and we won't look at all of them today, there's not enough time, but some of the things in particular that we'll look at is during the Last Supper, during uh, the Seder dinner on Thursday night in the upper room, they would have sat down and, of course, it wasn't the Last Supper to them, it was just supper. I'll let that sit for as long as it needs to sit, Right? He said, we have a reservation for our last supper. <laughs> Jesus said, what? Oh, sorry. Ju Judas says, oh, sorry. I meant uh, supper. It's just supper tonight. Um. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but they sat down for a Seder dinner. It was Passover in Jerusalem. And so they sat down for a Seder dinner, and they would have sat down, and they would have had... Um, Tapas, right? They would have had, right, small things on their plate. It's a round plate. Have you ever been to a traditional Seder dinner? And some of the things on the plate would have been sweet. And those things were to represent the good times that they had historically. They're remembering their history and, and their lineage and, and their ancestors through this Seder meal. And some of the things on the plate would have been bitter to remind them of the hard times and the difficult times. And, and, and some of the things would have been tied to their ancestors and what they had available to them and the ingredients and the regions and all of those things. And so everything on the plate has significance. And then they had the bread. And the bread was referred to in the Seder and is still referred to in the Seder dinner as the bread of affliction. And it remains a key point as we look at the story today and the mythos uh, around Easter this bread of affliction, what does that mean? It's the connecting, it's one of the main connecting pieces. The Easter mythos that is then built up is around this felt experience that the communion instructions both were and are a doorway into the eternal truth. What are those communion instructions? They're rather simple. Right? Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. And he takes that bread and he breaks it. And, and, the, and the communion instructions are uh, 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 simple. The, what I call the Christ covenant. Right? He adds one. This is the first one. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Love each other. Love one another. Love me, each other as you would have loved me. Right? When I'm gone, love each other as you would have loved me. Love one another. He names it in his ministry as the greatest commandment. Right? But the one that would have already been there, the one that contextually would have already been a sort of default setting in everybody's consciousness at the Seder dinner is number two, which is to break the affliction. The bread of affliction when you break the bread, you break the... In other words, part of the covenant is to remember that our job together as community is to go out into the world and break together as community to break the affliction. The bread represented that affliction, which was the oppression, uh, their enslavement, uh, their trial times, all of, all, you know, the abuse that they endured, etc., etc. And so to break that affliction means... It's a fancy way of saying to stand for justice, right? To stand for justice. Find the places where the affliction is still happening and break it. Stand up together and do something about it. Break the affliction. So the communion instructions for Jesus is he's putting this together. Very simple. Do what you, do. We already know that part of our job as community is to stand together and break the affliction. But let me add something for you. Love one another while you're doing it. Love everybody. Even the people who are responsible for the affliction. Love them too. Right? Love them too. Love each other as you would have loved me. And break the affliction. Continue to work on social transformation. That's why he was so dangerous. And at some point down the road, long after three days... 
long after, perhaps decades later, they realize that this affliction, this idea of the ultimate affliction, which would be the idea of separation between yourself and God, the thought, the mental construct that I am separate from God, that affliction was broken. You know, late last year in December, in November, and then in December we celebrated uh, um, the loss of our dear friend, uh, Bishop Carlton Pearson. And I still miss him, you know, deeply. And I still feel deeply, almost daily, how present he is in my life. I feel like if I picked up my phone and sent a text that, that I would get a response back, right? Like, it's that close, right? And there comes a moment in these followers of the way, as they were called, where they realize, hey, he's not gone. That love is still with us. That command is still with us. That's something, that's something that we felt is still with us. And the affliction or the idea that I am separate from that has been broken. I've had a moment, an aha moment, in which that affliction has been broken. And that becomes the Easter moment because in the time of Jesus, in this period, messiahs were supposed to save everyone, not be executed. Right? They were supposed to live forever and reign over the throne and change politics and the laws of the land. And therefore, the majority of people wrote Jesus off the moment that his heart stopped beating. Because he failed, at that time, the messianic litmus test. But there became a moment in consciousness... When the followers of the way, who had experienced so much joy, so much freedom, so much liberation uh, from his counterculture, shocking, table-turning, uh, grace-driven message of God's unyielding, one-directional love, that they couldn't let it go. Why? Because he reflected their wholeness back to them. Right? You ever had somebody like that in your life? Like, for me, Carlton is one of those people, right? He reflected my wholeness back to me. And because he did that, he'll always be with me. There's something about that relationship and that memory and that, and that, and that time that I can never let go of. It's not dead. You understand what I'm saying? When somebody reflects your wholeness back to you, they're with you forever. Because they have reminded you of who you are eternally. You follow what I'm saying? So this becomes critical to the moment of this Easter breakthrough in consciousness. The apostles start seeing grace everywhere. They start seeing the Christ presence, the universal term for the logos, for the divine nature in you and I, everywhere. They see this risen Christ, this appearance of grace in mysterious and unexpected physical forms on several accounts. But they didn't see it right away. And we would be remiss today if we didn't pause. It's the last Sunday of Women's History Month to say that first, the women. The apostles wrote about it, but it was the women who saw him first. And had it not been for these women who saw him first and then told the apostles about what they had seen and what they had experienced, we wouldn't be talking about this today. There's something about, and so what does that mean for us today? You know, there's, there's six women who see uh, the, the risen Christ in some form in the Gospels. And we hear, of course, of Mary uh, at the tomb. And when she first hears his voice, she mistakes him for the gardener. Which is, which is not a, a cute antidote by the author. It's a reflection back to Genesis that everything begins in the garden. And then later, anyway, I don't have time for that today. <laughs> 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 
But there's something about the divine feminine in all of us that knows something, and the divine feminine in the universe of, and the universal energy of consciousness that knows something about birth and death and resurrection. And it's that thing that is required to see the transfiguration, the transformation, and then later the embodiment, which happens through the Gospels and the stories that they begin to tell. But the incarnation and the appearance, seeing and recognizing, are not always the same thing. Oh, y'all didn't hear that? <laughs> seeing and recognizing are not always the same thing. First you see, she didn't recognize it right away. She saw him, but she didn't recognize him until he spoke. And any mother in here knows that it doesn't matter how far away your baby is, as I said at the Good Friday service at Hillside this week, Daddy! Daddy! There's something about that tone of voice when my son says that. He could be anywhere, but when he calls out, Daddy, I know that's my boy. You understand? Mothers know that too, right? There's something about that voice. And so when, 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 when she sees him, but she doesn't recognize him, and then he speaks, and she says, Teacher, Rabboni. Seeing and recognizing are not always the same thing. And so there's a pattern that we can lean into metaphysically that goes from internal insight, the consciousness, to choosing to recognize that which is already there. You realize you have to have the revelation first. For spiritual awakening, the recognition in our lives is that there's something that we, that we see in consciousness. And when we see it in consciousness, then our eyes are opened, and then we wake up and we see it everywhere. But it was already in all of those places. We just couldn't, we couldn't recognize it because we didn't see it. Oh, I'm talking now. We didn't recognize it out there because we didn't see it in consciousness first. And so the consciousness wakes up, and then we begin to recognize it everywhere. My dear friend, the late Bishop Jack Shelby Spong says, when the fall of Christianity, when the story of the fall is dismissed, traditional Christology cannot help but go with it. And a new Christology must emerge. As a phoenix rising from the ashes of the past, it will be a Christology based not on fall and rescue, sin and salvation, or even guilt and forgiveness, but on the call to wholeness, the power of love, and the enchantment of being. A new Christology will be based on, I believe, these three things. A narrative of conscious evolution, inclusivity through understanding universal principles, and liberation through transcendence. A narrative of conscious evolution that we are all on a path and that path cannot be denied. That there is an inclusive nature that everybody is connected because we understand a universal principle. It runs through all things. And a liberation that occurs through transcendence. But that's all beautiful theory. Now, how do we make that real? Our wholeness is already self-evident. Our wholeness is already in us. But we have to recognize it. We have to see it. Ernest Holmes in the uh, Science of Mind, in the chapter of the Christ, he says this, the Christ, I think I have this one for you, yes, the Christ triumphs over death and the grave. The Christ, the principle. He spent the whole chapter talking about the Christ, the principle, not the man, not the individual, but the principle of Christ consciousness. The Christ triumphs over death and the grave, ba breaks through the tomb of human limitation into the dawn of eternal expansion. The Christ rises from the ashes of human hope, pointing the way to greater realization of life. The Christ is always triumphant, is ever a victor, is never defeated, and needs no champion. Needs no champion. I love that particular line. I, I said to you, I think last week where I talked about, you know, every once in a while I think Ernest Holmes read some, wrote something, and he must have had to get up and just shout and run around the room a little bit, even though we're not a shouting people. He must have just, I think he put, you know, that's why he had it on all caps. That's his emphasis, not mine. That's from the original text. He put that down and said, hey, hallelujah. 
needs no champion. I want to break that down for just a little bit. You see, the problem that we have in, in our current expression of humanity and our recognition or lack thereof, I remember I said last week that, that the, 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 the um, Palm Sunday uh, journey of spiritual awakening is all about this line of now that you know who you are, what are you going to do about it? Since you know who you are, since there's something within you that already knows that it knows that it knows, even if you have doubts, even if you have concerns, even if you don't know where you're going to go and what direction is going to be, da, 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 but there's something within inside of you that already knows and it knows that it knows and it's just waiting for you to recognize it. Since you know who you are, what are you going to do about it? And Jesus has that moment. He says, since I know who I am, well, then I guess I'll just show up and be that presence. Let it heal who it heals and let it transform who it transforms. And let those who, who dislike it and who want to judge me for it and persecute me for it, let them do it. I don't, let, let, let them do it. Since I know who I am, why am I worried about the persecution they're trying to give to me? I know who I am. I know who's got my back. Right? And the, the whole journey can be summarized by that. Jesus knows who he is. And that's why he's not concerned. Well, there's those who cheer me and there's those who jeer me. I'm a, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Right? I don't know about you, but I know some, some trifling people. You know? <laughs> but sometimes you just got to be unconcerned about their trifling. Their, their, their trifleness. Right? Their, their, their trifology. Some people, some people got a whole theory about why they trifle. <laughs> they could trifology, you know, <laughs> and you, you don't want to get infected, you know, that's a trifecta, you don't want to get infected by their, their trifology, right? Where Ernest Holmes says this Christ presence is always triumphant, it's ever a victor, it's never defeated, it needs no champion. Why? Because principles don't need champions. That which is a principle, electricity is a principle. Somebody say, break it down, Rev. That's going to come on. Electricity is a principle, just like the Christ presence is a principle, right? It's a principle there. It's there to be utilized. It's there to be accessed. It's there to be recognized. You set things up properly. It'll do certain things. When we recognize a principle, we can use the principle in our consciousness. Everybody with me? The electricity is a principle. It will illuminate things if we allow it to illuminate things. It will burn things if we allow it to burn things. It is there. It has existed. The, the potentiality for electricity existed when Moses walked the earth. And it wasn't invented out of something. It was discovered. It was already there. It's a principle. Principles don't need champions. Principles need demonstrations. Principles don't need champions. It really wouldn't be very effective if we were all champions of electricity sitting here in the dark. Oh, great God of illumination, we beseech you to come into our lives and to illuminate and to yada, 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 and we're just sitting here in the dark and we could just see better if you just show yourself and God saying, flip the switch. Christ doesn't need a champion. Christ needs a demonstration. When we begin to demonstrate the Christ, when we begin to, dip, and he told us how to do it, love each other and break the affliction. It's that simple. It's, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. It's that simple. Rabbis had a way of teaching. It was called their yoke. He said, I'm going to keep it simple for you all. Love each other and break the affliction. We have too many champions for Jesus and not enough demonstrations of Christ consciousness. It's late in the day. There have been a lot of church services already that have concluded. There's been a lot of praise of Jesus today all around the world, all across this country. Too many champions for Jesus, not enough demonstrations of Christ consciousness. Why? Because loving your neighbor is hard. Because they're trifling. Right? Because, because they're, 
doing stupid things. If we just be <laughs> frank about it, it's hard to love people when they do stupid things. You know, it's not impossible. My son does stupid things. I still love him. But I say, that was stupid. No, I don't say that. <laughs> but in my mind, I go, well, you know. <laughs> How many people know some people that are doing some... Including ourselves. We look in the mirror and go, I do some stupid things. Yeah, right. I do some stupid things sometimes. And I still got to love myself. Amen. So, so loving ourselves is hard. Loving each other is hard. But that's what forgiveness is for. That's what forgiveness is for. That's why Jesus said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgive them. Release the burden. And if you can't do it, then call on somebody else to do it. That's what that Good Friday moment was about. The words that I spoke about Friday night at the Good Friday, uh, uh, Friday afternoon, Good Friday service, when Jesus says, Father, forgive them for not what they do. The, the principle there is about forgiveness, of course, and we know that forgiveness is a good spiritual practice to integrate into our life for all of those reasons that we just mentioned. We do stupid things. Other people do stupid things. We should forgive ourselves, release the expectations, uh, give that gift of love to ourselves, stop drinking uh, poison, hoping the other person would die, all of that stuff, right? But sometimes we experience things that feel too big to forgive, right? Sometimes it's like, mm, yeah, I don't know. That one's a little broader than my shoulders, you know? That one's just a little too far. It's just a little, I don't know about that. That's why Jesus said, Father, you do it. You do it. I can't do it. I, 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 I'm too wrapped up in how stupid it is, right? I'm too wrapped up in, in how whatever it is. I'm too wrapped up in my, but, you, but I know there's a power within me, which is where he told us to find the Father, Father within that does the work. You do it. There's a power within you greater than you are, and you can use it. But if I can, if you can indulge me for just a minute, I think it's more than just that. I think the reason why we have too many champions and not enough demonstrations of Christ consciousness, and not just because loving our neighbor is hard. I think maybe the real reason is because embodiment must start with us. Right? You can't, you can't recognize something unless it first lives in you. You can't recognize something unless it first lives in you. That's when, when Mary heard the voice, that voice lived inside. It was her teacher. She knew that voice. So it looked different than what she was expecting, but it lived in her. You can't recognize something that doesn't first live in you. There's that which in you that lives beyond your doubts, beyond your fears, beyond your dark nights and your lonely passages of time, beyond your likes and dislikes, your dreams and disappointments, beyond your politics and beyond your religious creeds, beyond, beyond all of those things. Behold the real you, which is beyond all of that. Find that. And you will live forever. Ernest Holmes says in his Easter message in 1955, Today the horizon is clear. The voyage starts anew and we are reborn. The true resurrection is not only from this life to the next, but it takes place daily, hourly, as we shed the limiting concepts of life that have come into the vineyard to gather the fruits of the Spirit hanging rich from the trees of the vines of God. A person may be reborn and remade and renewed in mind and in body just through taking a little bit of time to get acquainted with their better self, through coming into recognition of the invisible and almost unknown guest who accompanies everyone through life, the spiritual presence within. We should recognize and resurrect ourselves to the joy and the simplicity and the spontaneity of life and leave the corpse of the dead yesterdays in the tombs of their own obscurity. We should live a more abundantly this way in God. We should come out of our own tomb of ignorance and disbelief. And how glorious shall be the new dawn. Seeing is personal. The seeing comes first. Seeing is personal. But recognition is relational. And so the covenant is simple again. Love each other and heal the affliction. 
when you can do this, and I want us to understand what it means to be a champ, not a champion, but a demonstration of Christ consciousness, how that shows up. It has real world implications. When you give your full attention to whatever you're doing, you're recognizing the constant renewal of life all around you. Whenever uh, you, with compassion, open your heart and your mind and your soul to the pain of the world, you help bring suffering beings back into the land of the living. Every time you forgive someone, it's another resurrection in the making. When you're practice of gratitude, when you're practicing gratitude, you're slaying or breaking the affliction of the death-dealing forces of apathy and despair and taking things for granted. When you can welcome the guest and the alien ideas with graciousness, you are participating in a new world of hospitality, breaking the affliction of us and them. When you work for justice and freedom and equality, you set the stage for resurrection. When you feed the hungry and stand up for the oppressed, when you you raise from the dead those who have been marginalized and disregarded and discarded by powers and principalities who would rather not bother. When you support a family in need, when you do all of these things, love each other, heal the affliction. It's happening right now. I want you to know that. Right here in the state of Georgia, there's something happening in the South, an affliction that our state and other, the states around us are participating in, which is a, 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 a dismantling of voting rights and, and gerrymandering of districts that the Supreme Court has already stepped in and said is illegal and unconstitutional, and the states are doing it anyway. They're doing it anyway. And, and there's been, I think, over, we've been telling you about it, over 400 anti-LGBT, mostly anti-trans legislations happening in state houses across uh, the nation. There were over 20 here in Georgia. And here, and so this is happening everywhere. It's all around us. And in most places around, surrounding Georgia, it looks a little worse than it does here. But I want you to know something. When we decide to love everyone and break the affliction... It has real-world consequences. There were nearly 20 anti-trans bills here in Georgia in the State House, either in the House or in the Senate, that were up for legislation. The legislative session has ended last, just this last week. Not a single one of them passed. Not a single one. We defeated every single one of them because people of faith and Georgia Equality and other organizations stood up and said something. They said, we're standing up for human dignity. We're standing up to love everyone and to break the affliction. And and they tried the same tools and tricks that are being tried throughout the South and throughout the nation, but mostly throughout the South, uh, of all kinds of weird maneuvers and backflips of, of just breaking rules and doing things that are just completely outrageous. And in Georgia, none of them worked. They all backfired. And here's what's going to happen. I mean, there were, there were uh, uh, bills that were about don't say gay. There were bills about uh, forcing outing uh, in schools. There were bills to redefine sex, uh, to exclude uh, trans identities. There were bills to uh, restrict gender-affirming care. There were bills to uh, ban students participating in, uh, trans students from participating in sto- sports, on and on. I'm not going to read all of them, but they, right? And they all failed. And here's what's going to happen as a result of that. Now, the effort will continue in next legislative session, there, you know, the, the, the energy will come back. But as those efforts and continue to fail, those that are propping up those efforts will begin to shift to something else. Because they'll say, this isn't popular. And as long as it's not popular, we're not going to continue to try to do it. Right? And so that's what I mean when, when we become a demonstration for Christ, when we decide to love one another, when we decide to say, you know what? What I know is that trans people are human, period, right? Period. And because they're human, that means they're also divine. 
And, and in the face of your inhumanity and indignity in the legislation that you want to try to deny their humanity, you're denying their divinity. And I'm a person of faith, so I'm going to step in here and say no. Right? And it's just that simple. I'm just going to step in here and say no, because I recognize their humanity. I recognize their divinity. You're going to have to choose something else. You're going to have to do something else. That behavior doesn't stand. And that behavior will begin to back off and do something else. That's what happens when we stand up for each other. That's what happens when we decide to love everyone and break the affliction. So I want to make it clear. This is not about praising something that happened thousands of years ago or some story that was told in a particular way or give thanks for the scriptures and the way that they were given or the songs that we sing. No, it was an instruction. Love everyone. Love everyone and break the affliction. Do that and there will be a demonstration of Christ consciousness that will break out everywhere and you will discover as they discovered that energy isn't dead. There's an eternal presence that resides within us as I invite the practitioners to come forward and join me in prayer. There's an eternal God presence that is ever springing forward, welling up, to burst forth into creativity, into life, into expression, into, into the fullness of itself. It's known as our wholeness and known as our divinity. And that power and that presence is fully capable of healing and transforming the world. It begins with ourselves. First, we have to see it through conscious insight. Conscious insight comes through prayer and meditation. It comes through deep study. It comes through the willingness to sit and to silence all of the noise of the outside world until something wells up inside of us and says, this is eternal and I'm here, right here see it. Then we begin to recognize it everywhere that we go. We see the grace of God. We see the opportunities to be the grace of God. We see the opportunities to be generous and to be kind and to be loving and to be a healing presence wherever we go to serve. And then God breaks out all over the place. And it comes back to us and it heals our bodies and our minds, removes depression and anxiety heals the physicality of our cells, renews and regenerates. There is a presence that is eternal and it wants to live as you. There is a power within you greater than you are and you can use it. And so we use it this day. We remember who and what we are and now that we know who we are, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to show up to make more love and more generosity and more justice and more peace evident and available and present everywhere that we go. The choice is ours to roll back the stone, to walk free into a new creation and to say, this presence, this love lives again. For this and so much more, I'm truly grateful and thankful. As I release these words, I know that something wonderful is happening for me, for the life of this community, for every individual within the sound of my voice, and for the planet itself, and all of creation, and all of humanity. I say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And so it is. So it is. Peace and blessings. Thank you. Beautiful time for our tithes and offerings, and I'm so grateful that you're here today. I'm so grateful for all of our uh, pledgers who give regularly. Uh, I sent an email out to, to all of our pledgers earlier this week. I uh, hope you received that to say thank you because you make this possible. You make this experience possible. And there's somebody here for the first time or somebody listening online for the first time or you're going to share this message. You're going to share the broadcast or send it to somebody. They're going to hear it for the first time and they're going to say, I never heard... Easter that way. I never heard Jesus that way. I never heard the message of love that way. I never, that way it changed, it shifted something in me, and we wouldn't have been able to deliver it unless your gift was there to support it. 
So I'm deeply grateful for all of us, all of us who support on a regular basis on automatic giving. I want to encourage you in this season as we kind of close out the first quarter of the year and in April move into the second quarter. Um, I'll be very frank. We need more support. We'll talk about it at our, at our um, annual meeting. Um, I'm grateful for the support we have, and there's room for more. There's room for more, and we're ready to receive that more because we know we're doing something good, and we know that people are being impacted by it, uh, and we're grateful for that, and we want to keep that going. Uh, so please, if you have the capacity in this moment to do more, it's a special day. I want to invite you to do that. Uh, if you're giving for the first time, uh, we make it very easy for you. Uh, text to give any amount, 404-800-9467. You can scan the QR code on the screen. You can go to our website. Uh, you can all do it right there from the comfort of your seat uh, or home if you're watching at home, if you have cash or check and you want to participate in the move of the service as, as the song is happening, even as I'm speaking, you can come up and drop it in one of our receptacles on either side of the room by the doors. And we are grateful to receive all that is coming to us and through us and as us because it's simply the divine reflecting itself back to itself. And what I know is that divine ideas are supported by the infinite intelligence of the universe. A seed has within it Everything that it needs, so long as it's planted in the right place, it has everything that it needs to become its full, authentic self. And I know that Spiritual Living Center of Atlanta is a divine idea, a divine seed in the mind of God, and therefore has all that it needs to become its full and authentic self and to live fully and abundantly to continue to reach and to share this message. So let's hold our gifts today uh, and let's give great gratitude for them. With these words, I live in a universe of abundance as I freely and joyfully give. I join in the divine flow and all that I share with life returns to me multiplied abundantly. And so it is. And so we are. Peace and blessings. Reverend Dr. David Alexander once again. Yes. So grateful for your leadership. Happy Easter, everybody. We envision a world that works for everyone and for all, all of creation. We see all people, all beings as expressions of God. We see a world that works for everyone. We envision a world that works for everyone and for all, all of creation. All people, all beings, as expressions of God, we see a world that works for everyone. Yeah, we envision a world that works for everyone and for all, all of creation. We see all people, all beings, as expressions of God.